All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Hannes. And I'm Konstantin, and we will we'll work for Freeletics. And today we would like to talk about advanced recipes in NVI development. Yeah, so who of you ha has already worked with some NVI-ish architecture pattern, or at least have heard of it? Cool, nice. Wow, that is good because it's going to be a little bit more advanced than, let's say, the usual traditional one-on-one -on -one getting started with MBI talks. Um, so it looks like we have some technical problems. Anyways, so I will continue in the meantime. So, uh, MVI, or model view intent, as you may know, has been inspired by, or has been defined uh, in the web world by uh, a guy named Andre Stals, um, or Andre Medeiros, as his full name is. And the main idea behind this is to get a um, unidirectional data flow with a single source of truth, which is kind of the state. And this talk is going to be a lot about state management and I hope that the slides are coming back. Um, yeah, so MVI. Why do we need yet another pattern? So we have MVC, MVVP, MVVM, now MVI. I mean, why and what? So what MVI does a little bit different than all the other patterns, and therefore I see, think MVI is kind of the next like natural evolution step, is it takes state management very serious. So what is the problem with, let's say, MVP? So we have to load a list of person, you know, just from backend, show a loading indicator in the meantime, then show the response, and show a loading uh, indicator, or in case of an error, show an error indicator, right? So the problem is that the presenter tries to manage kind of the state, you know? He interacts with the view and say, oh, show loading, show content, show error, whatever, right? So one could argue that this is just an uh, MVP-ish problem, but you could do, or you are still doing, I guess, exactly the same thing with MVVM, right? So you have live data, you have your fields, and then you set, like, the value for loading to true or false, right? So nothing too fancy, but reality is um, that in a real world example, you have a lot of that, you know? And wait, there's even more. So um, while I have agreed that, or have to commit that this is not just uh, a, a nice class and that's probably a little bit too much, but I think you get the point, right? And the error of this kind of pattern to have like this interaction with a presenter or view model managing state is that probably you get into some web situation like that, which is hard to track back where, we, where it comes from, um, hard to debug, and it's just a visual annoying thing for the user. In best case, in worst case, the app crashed. All right, so how is MVI different? So in MVI we have like the, the user interface, right? Then we have the user. The user triggers some input, right? And that's called intent. And it's called intent uh, because it's like the intention to change something now. Don't get confused, it's not like the intent from Android framework to start a new activity or service or whatever. It's like just the name we copied over from the web world where we called it intent. Um, and as I said before, it goes through the business logic. Uh, the business logic then kind of processes this intention and creates a new state out of it. So you see we have this unidirectional data flow where at the end the user triggers inputs or intents, and at the end the UI renders just state. So you see this nice uh, unidirectional data flow. So if you have worked with MVI before, this is probably not too, too new or too different from what you know before, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about state. So we're not going to talk too much about state because there are already some good, uh, good um, talks about it. One by Christina Lee, which I will mention later. Um, but just to get everyone on board at what, what, what it means when you talk about state. So state could be something like this seal class with having like loading, content, and error for the same example, loading a list of persons that I showed before in MVP or MVVM, right? So this is the talk by Christina Lee where she goes really in deep uh, in depth uh, about state management and not, not state management, about um, modeling state. So you should definitely give it uh, a try or check it out if you're interested in that one. We will have links at the end of the presentation so you don't have to type in now everything in your little smartphone or screen. Um, yeah, but for the rest of the talk, mostly we will focus on that part, which is like the state management, okay? 
So in MVI, because you have a presenter or a view model that survives screen orientation changes, it gets the intent uh, from the view and just forwards this to the state machine. We now call the state machine the business logic below and gets back a state to the view model or presenter and then just the state gets displayed or that's also the responsibility of the view model or presenter it might transform the state from the state machine to something more meaningful for for the view for instance it could apply diff utils for calculate the diff result for a recycler view adapter and stuff like that so that's kind of the responsibility of the presenter to take the state and if it makes sense i'm not saying that you should do that for everything but if it makes sense to convert the state to something more android specific the presenter or the view model is the place where you should do that all right, so view is kind of considered as fragment or activity in our talks, but there are different opinions, of course, which is very welcome. Uh, so if you would like to hear why uh, Vasily, uh, sorry if I pronounce your, your name wrong, uh, thinks that um, activities and fragments are not uh, views, then you should go to his talk um, tomorrow. So, Kostya. Yeah. So, how do we convert our uh, observable network request to a state? So, something from this to this. Well, it's actually not too complicated. Rx uh, Java already provides us a kind of a state machine on its own. So we could basically uh, create another observable out of observable, start it with loading to get the loading state immediately, then map the successful result to a content state and in case of error, return an error state. So we uh, get rid of this uh, on next on error uh, routine and to get actual state that represents the uh, state uh, what will be later reviewed. But wait, does that mean now we're going to move like every HTTP request to something like that? Well, we could, but it could get really complicated. Let's see if you have like uh, already two states out of HTTP requests and you try to combine them, then you have to write something like this. We have to go and check all the intermediate states. So in some cases, it could be much easier basically to combine them on the stage when there are still HTTP requests. This example, for instance, we're loading several pages of persons and then we glue them together and then we create a state of, out of it. So it gets a little bit more easy to read and easy to maintain. Right, so the rule of thumb is kind of, since Rx Java is already a state machine in its own, then probably for HTTP requests, we only use that at the highest level of interaction with then the layer above as a state machine, because it makes combining us, things like that Absolutely. easier. Ah, cool. So let's talk a little bit more about advanced state machines. So we saw a very, very simple state machine, right? Let's define something like a calculator state machine. So let's imagine we have to write a calculator application. And the first thing we would do is we would define inputs event. So why would we give this kind of state machine its own input events? Well, imagine that we would just pass in strings or integers. Then we basically can pass in any arbitrary string or integer as an input event to the state machine. And by creating a single class with Kotlin, for instance, we get like compile time correctness checks for the inputs we can handle. And it reduces the amount from any arbitrary string to just for cases that we, can, uh, we are expecting as an input, right? Cool. And we do basically the same with state, which is the output. So we have like the result, which is like the result of the calculator. And in case we do something weird like div division by zero or something like that, we can also reach our state. So how could we implement this? Well, we could use the uh, publish relay from, from Jake Wharton's library, um, which we make like only visible for internal purpose. And then we offer an input, as, which is a consumer, which is Rx Java-ish uh, way for subscribing to an Rx stream. Uh, and by the way, um, it's also worthwhile to mention that you don't necessarily have to use uh, Rx Java for building an MBI architecture uh, uh, or um, yeah, but you can use anything basically you would like. But the nice thing about Rx Java is that it's really good at modeling events over time. And that's exactly what happens all the time in, in our apps, right? The user triggers something, a network request triggers something, gets triggered or returns something like a result over time. And that's why Rx Java really shines, I think. 
And then you would have something like a state as an output, which then uses the internal uh, input relay and just do something meaningful with the inputs, right? And we get this clear interface of inputs, outputs, and the two kind of uh, fields you can access from the outside, which is for uh, triggering some inputs and listening for the output. So the nice thing about this interface is that now nobody really cares how bad your actual implementation is about this because you offer this really nice interface and can refactor it afterwards. Um, so I'm not going too much into detail about the scan operator. Who has heard of the scan operator before? Yeah, right. Who has actually used it? Also some people. So the idea of the scan operator is that you get the current state and the input event and then you compute out the new state. So this sounds like a reducer from Redux web world, right? And it kind of works, but it turns out it's a little bit hard to work with this sometimes. And what if we go even super fancy and just implement Redux uh, state machine? So the difference uh, or the, the new things from Redux is that there's a store. A store is basically unobservable for the state. So it offers like the same um, API I showed you before. So you have a state, you can subscribe. And there is now an action. Well, they just name it action and it's slightly different from what an intent is in my opinion, but it's basically the same concept. So actions are input to this Redux based state machine. And you have a reducer, which is similar to the scan operator. It takes a state and the an action and returns a new state. And we have isolated side effects, and I will talk a little bit more about that. So let's have a concrete example. Uh, but first, um, there are also other talks about similar or same concepts, like Spotify has its own kind of Redux-inspired library. Um, you should, oh, it's actually right after us, so we're basically the warm-up band, nice. And same for uh, Shopify. I'm not sure if they have their own library, but they will talk about the race of the state machines, or he will talk about the race of the state machine, which is also, yeah, right after us. So, what is now the difference between intent and action, and why not calling it intent? So, basically, I think we should stick with the term action, because if you Google for Redux, you will see a lot of resources, because it's quite popular in the web world, and therefore, let's just stick with actions. So, I showed you this picture before, which is kind of intent and uh, view state out, and it's, yeah, you can do that with a scan operator to kind of reduce the state, and in Redux, we kind of changed the intent to something like action, but the other thing is now, um, in Redux, also a side effect can trigger like an action as an input to the whole, um, um, to the whole um, um, state machine, which was a little bit, it was also possible to do with like the scan operator, but was a little bit more tricky. So let's go for a concrete example, like loading uh, a list of items, like list of persons, like we did before, but with pagination. So whenever you scroll down, you see like a progress in, uh, animation and um, yeah, a progress animation, and the next page will load it and then display it. So. Before we start, we kind of have a state. The state is basically just displaying a list. And now we would like to trigger a new action to load the next page. So what's happening is um, the next page action gets triggered from the view via an intent. And then it's probably to something like an action, or it is an intent directly. That's up to you. So the action goes into the state machine of Redux. And as you see, we have the reducer on the left and a side effect called next page on the right. And what the side effect does is it takes an action, or it gets registered for an action, in this case, the next page in action. And it also returns an action. So we will talk about it in a minute. But first, let's focus on the reducer. So what this, the reducer basically says, oh, next page. I'm not interested in that. I'm just returning the previous screen, right? And on the right, you see the um, UI didn't change. So next, the side effect who, who was also registered for the next page um, kind of gets the action too. And what it does is now it's going to make the HTTP request, right? So it's getting for the cloud. But at the same time, it returns an action, now the loading action. The loading action then goes through the reducer and now uh, the reducer knows, oh, that's a loading action. Ah, I have to uh, take the previous state, which was the list of items, and display like the progress bar for the next loading next page, right? 
And then once the HTTP request returns its, its value, we kind of do the same. We emit again a result next page action, which then again goes through the presenter, uh, through the reducer. And then the reducer kind of creates a new state out of it, like making, merging two lists like the previous list and now the new list of persons into one single list, removes the loading indicator uh, flag from the state, and that's it. And the nice thing about the side effect thing is that we can have la now multiple side effects uh, rather than having one stream, then a scan operator and stuff like that. We can split them in single, um, in single use cases, so to speak, from the clean architecture that do just one job. And we can have like a plugin system where we have like side effects for arbitrary many, many side effects your app has to deal with. And basically, we have built our kind of um, library around this, which is based on Rx Java heavily. So in contrast to other libraries, at least to my knowledge, they are not based on Rx Java per se, but rather see Rx Java as an additional plugin to do side effects or making some async HTTP requests and stuff like that. But our implementation is really based on Rx Java in terms of it's actually the Redux store is just an extension function, but it's actually an Rx operator. So it's really first class citizen um, rather than just a plugin. And yeah, and there is the link to this repository. Again, the, the link will be at the end. Uh, but it's not fully open sourced yet, so we just have put up some readme and would like to discuss if it makes sense to open source this further because we don't want to reinvent the, the wheel over and over again. So if you have a strong opinion and would like to talk about it, I would love to hear your feedback. So the last thing, or the nice thing about MVI is testing. So testing in general is quite easy because, you know, you trigger some action or input or intent at whatever level you would like to test, and then you kind of get a state back, right? And it's as easy as saying as it equals um, expected state and the actual state, right? Nothing fancy. But there's more. We can actually get rid of idling resources if we do like some espresso testing, and we don't actually need espresso that much anymore. How? Um, well, let's say we have something like an activity that just renders the state, right? And it triggers some intents from this button click. Um, so to get this more testable, we first have to introduce a new concept of um, view binding. So basically, we are just moving all this responsibility of interacting with UI widgets out from our activity into a separate class view binding. And we just delegate everything to this binding. So the render state method just calls binding.renderState. Oh, I forgot to pass the state as a parameter here, but I think you get the idea. So how does this look like? So view binding basically just takes the root view, which we grab from find view by ID. And yeah, just implements the render method. Nothing, nothing too fancy compared to what we did before. But what I forgot to mention is now we kind of inject the binding, um, f for instance, with our dependency injection to like dagger into the activity. Why? So now for testing, we could do the following. For testing, we kind of create a subclass of this new binding that actually just does the same as the original view binding but it kind of intercepts all state machines and all state changes and records them. For instance, we use a replay uh, relay. Why replay? Because then we get all states over time, so the com complete full history and can always like compare the full history of all state changes. This enables us also to kind of verify if there were some states happening in between, state changes happening in between, they were not actually planned, right? So we have the full history of all state changes intercepted in this view binding class. And we can even go one step further and, oh sorry, and we offer, sorry, we offer that rendered state uh, observable, which is kind of then the replay uh, uh, relay. And the test then basically can just do trigger intent and then blocking wait for until the next state gets rendered and verify that the state is basically the state we are expecting. So we, did, we don't need any idling resources because this is a push-based uh, approach rather than pulling, which is what uh, idling resources in this process is doing. It's actually just a while loop that asks every few milliseconds, uh, can we proceed, can we proceed, can we proceed, can we proceed? And with this approach, we basically block the threat of the, of the, instru of the instrumentation test and wait until we actually get pushed a new state and then do the verification. 
And we can go one step further and make a, a screenshot out of this uh, layout that we're going to present, because this is kind of the moment in time where we have changed the state, and also the layout will going to happen. There's this tool from Facebook that could do the job for you. Yeah, so your application usually use tracking. And how do you do the, how do you bond the tracking in the unidirectional data flow where you have like this loop of events and sync? Well, actually there is a way. But first I would like to talk about concept of multicasting. So the idea is like every RIX uh, observable could be subscribed by several uh, consumers independently and in parallel. And for this reason, we have to use a connected observables. There is a perfect talk from Kashi Gopal, who explains it's really nice and uh, and and nice. <laughs> so uh, for tracking, we start with uh, tracking the user events. Uh, luckily, we already have the uh, intense relay, which we introduced uh, earlier. And for this reason, we have to multi multicast it and then subscribe for it and just track necessary events we have. And well, uh, where do we do it? So uh, track it, tracking doesn't really belong to your business logic. It neither belongs to the view. So we put it in our middle layer, the presenter or view model, whatever you call it, in your application. And that's how you track user events for page impressions or some kind of states, you also have a well-described uh, object that represents your current state and for this reason you also multicast it and track the screens. And that's pretty much it. So you have a tracking for your whole activity. Uh, what about navigation? For navi navigation could be really simple. In simple cases, Let's imagine our like, virtual example of sign-in page. We describe the states for it, so there is uh, user input, uh, there is actual progress of signing in, there is error state, and there is a successful state. And for this simple case, we can basically delegate the whole navigation to the view, which would likely be your activity or fragment. So one of the render method implementation could be like, like this. That's fine, but what if you have something more complicated? For instance, this like a bunch of fragments that are served by the same state machine, and you have to navigate back and forth, and you also have to keep the states in meanwhile. So for this reason, uh, I would like to introduce the concept of so-called navigator. It's just a class that encapsulates everything you might need for doing actual navigation. For instance, like fragment manager or activity reference which you could inject again in your presenter and then basically multicast your state machine, intercept some states, and in some cases you navigate, you, navigate, you let your navigator navigate to some predefined set of destinations, which is also a good thing. So you have a well-described uh, set of possible destinations from your screen, which sometimes help to understand the new code as well. And actual implementation, is just like a switch uh, of all destinations which does the trick. Uh, yeah, uh, how do you actually implement a navigator is totally up to you. For instance, you could put the logic for A-B testing inside. It's totally fine. You just provide your, like, uh, your feature flex and then do the decision inside. So your uh, MVI state machine doesn't really care about these things. Also, all the activity and like Android specific reference are kept inside Navigator. So for testing, you can inject a fake one or completely uh, mocked one. And I mean, you don't really have to have an activity. You can also use a new architecture components and do exactly the same. You can use a coordinator uh, pattern, which will achieve the same results for you. So yeah, and. Uh, again, so Navigator is perfectly testable. It really hides the uh, uh, platform dependencies and it also makes your code much more clear. Next case uh, of using MVI state machine uh, could be the uh, animation. Have you ever thought that your animation could be actually backed by business logic? So it's not like only view sync. So that's a real example, like from our app. So we have a first screen where we have a button 
which is our triggers, and then there is a like smooth transition which converts into progress bar, and then like text changes, and then when the navigation of uh, the animation is finished, you can see the result, something like your workout, and think. Let's let's shortly describe our state for now. So we have like exactly four states for these four cases. So that will be like initial state, there will be like progress transition, there will be like progress, uh, where we actually have like everything we need to render in the state included. And that's our final state. So voila, we have our KeyCast observable where we can do, uh, where we basically map the user intents, we filter them, we have our heartbeat uh, timer, and then we map our heartbeat timer, and then we decide on this heartbeat timer if we really finish the animation or not, and then we emit different states. Yeah, but, but wait, the, the, I, get, I get the point. So this is now super testable. So we now can test animations uh, because they're triggering like state transitions. But I mean, nobody can read this. I mean, in one month, I, I, can't, I can't read this. I yeah, can't absolutely. remember what I did there. So, but uh, luckily, we have a way to write asynchronous and event-driven code as normal imperative code in Kotlin, and it's called coroutines. So coroutines sometimes fit very well for such tasks. So here, we basically substitute our uh, crazy observable to a normal uh, mapping of uh, our, our uh, intense stream and then like tiny loop with tiny delay. Uh, another advantage of coroutines is that you can emit uh, the state anytime, basically. So you not lim you, you don't have to run uh, like you, you don't have to cover all the cases. Sometimes you can skip them. Sometimes you can emit like several states in one round. And another good part about coroutines is there are a whole bunch of adapters, and one of adapters is basically converts the coroutine to the RIGS observable, so you can write your crazy complicated code using coroutines and then use it as normal observable. Uh, next tricky stuff when you uh, do MVI is actually restoring the state. Uh, for instance, you have the activity rotation, you have the yeah, you have the back stack navigation case, and you really need to, to remember where you've been before. So let's go back to our uh, wizard example, and let's just describe uh, the states in more details. So we would uh, have like three tiny substates, which would be accumulated by one big state uh, for the whole screen. So it's like a first fragment where you remember which option you selected. This is the second one with some random information, third one as well. And at the end, it goes like all together, all three screens are combined in one. And good part about this uh, object, it has literally all the information to restore the state at the end. So it knows which screen was shown, it knows the state of each screen as well, uh, each subscreen as well. So wherever you Restore it from your bundle. You can immediately display it, and you will have exactly you will continue exactly where you left. Yeah. So, some small tips and tricks. Uh, how to handle on activity result? It's an intent. Yay. You just uh, convert your uh, on activity result. It's like you simulate a user action, and then you handle it. So what about on request permission to start? It's an intent. Nice. And what about lifecycle callbacks? Just guess. It's an intent. <laughs> what about if rendering happens too often and you get some UI glitches or animation, especially uh, distracting for animations? It's not an intent. But. Since we do kind of atomic updates, something with like that, so we do an animation on the cycle view where we remove item one and item two, uh, no, item two and item, no, item two and add item 101, we get kind of this glitch, right? So you see like item two is disappearing, but at the same time item 101 who has been insert is appearing. And those kind of things were triggered by two different render, render events. So first we render just removing the, uh, the item number two, and then right afterwards we render insert item 101 and then we get kind of to this weird animation which is 
occasions in most cases, I guess. But since we have like this atomic um, updates of Randolph, we could basically achieve the much nicer way of waiting until we have rendered the first part and then render the second uh, state event. So we can easily uh, do that with, um, with an MVI-ish approach where we have just one single render function, so to speak, where we get the state out of it. So we can basically wait until we have rendered something and then continue with the next one. So we run a little bit out of time, so I will just quickly walk through this. How could we refactor uh, your existing app? So basically the first thing where we suggest you to start is refactor or introduce states and introduce like new states. Why? Because then you know exactly what the output of the whole workflow will be. If you start doing the, like the state machine, which would be obvious because it's hidden behind a nice API, then maybe you get to the point where you have like a super nice state machine, but it's actually not exactly the state you need in your UI. So start with the UI. Uh, work then your way downwards. So then replace all view dot show something or live that live data dot uh, uh, live data dot set value with x whatever in your view model on MVP with just one single render method to get this atomic. Write some tests for it. Then you can ensure that with the next ongoing business logic uh, refactoring, you are on the safe side. And then yeah, define some clear inputs and outputs. That's what I mentioned before. That's useful to have like um, correctness checks by your compiler. And um, yeah, then try to trigger intents. So first we kind of do the output, uh, the state observable thing for UI, and now we continue with going with the inputs, we find some intents, uh, and make them somehow into your state machine. Cool, that's all we have. We will upload mm -hmm. the slides afterwards, and sorry for the long delay in the beginning, and thanks for attending. Thanks so much. I'm not um, sure, do we have I time for questions? We would have, we have time for questions and I would like to ask the next speaker, Eric Dare, to come join me at this side. Cool. Any questions? Here we have one. Or two. So we can also yes. talk afterwards. Uh, if, the, if we run out of time, we will be around. So feel free to approach us. Uh, yeah. Yep. One question. How do you avoid having a really, really big God class state machine? Because that thing has basically to grab all interactions you have in your whole app. Sorry. Otherwise, you have conflicting states, which would mean you have conflicting renders. Can you answer that? The key is to create a smaller substate and this combine the smaller substates later. So that's what we will do. Yeah, otherwise, we can continue this discussion afterwards if that's not a satisfying answer. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? Uh, just one question. Uh, what have you noticed in terms of the growth of the code base once you start implementing MVI? Does it, does it lead to you having to write a lot more code than you normally would to accomplish the task you're trying to, to accomplish? Well, I would argue that it's not writing more code, but putting the code in one place. So think of your existing code base. You may have a little bit of state management in your adapters, from your cycle view, in your activity, in your presenter, someone in your HTTP request. And now what we're trying to do with MDI is bring those state management related stuff into one place down in your business logic. And one could argue, yeah, we are writing more like see classes for intents and inputs and outputs, but on one hand this kind of is like uh, the, the advantages are the correctness you get from compile time checks rather than having just any method invocation with some strings and stuff like that. So I would say overall the, the size won't increase that much, um, but it's a learning curve to find the right balance when to introduce like inputs, intents, actions and stuff like that. Yeah, actually, I was about to ask, um, maybe if you can ask another one, about the learning curve. So onboarding new people onto this type of architecture, have you seen any challenges with it? Yeah, so um, it depends. So the way we have used RxJava before is basically just as a replacement for async task and doing HTTP requests. Um, here we now have like an, a stream that is never ending until the screen gets uh, gets destroyed, which was kind of a learning curve, true. Um, we have explained uh, the trick with the um, um, coroutines that could help with some readability. But yeah, it needs some learning, but it needs some learning for everything. And I think the important bit here is it's in general a hard topic to do async tasks. Therefore, the problem is hard in its, in its definition. 
does Eric's Java help there? I think so, once you get a little bit used to this functional approach to this whole thing. But I think the problem per se is the hard one, not like the implementation about this thing. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Do you have an example, an open source, a GitHub, or somewhere to f see this working? Um, yes, I can give you some links afterwards. So there are some minor projects also in the architecture, blueprints uh, from Google, there is an MDI implementation uh, by Benoit from Square. Uh, yeah, but I can give you some link afterwards. Just uh, hit me or approach me. So don't hit me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. Just, just a quick one uh, about the blurred lines between MVVM, MVI, and all that thing. So, yeah, uh, I can tell you, can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah, uh, the question is about uh, do you see any challenges about uh, adopting uh, a state based approach for uh, MVVM? So for MVVM, I would recommend to have just one live data state rather than having multiple live data. Why? Because it makes these atomic updates on your, on your view um, predictable and you know, you, you know exactly that this state um, has been changed at this and this line to that and that state. And not like in MVI where you kind of go from your view, view uh, sorry, from the MVVM where you check your view state, or okay, it's the view, then you check in the presenter what's the state of the loading live data, what's the state of the error live data, and then you track that down to the business logic. In MVI, you basically know exactly where you set this thing and can track it down to you, ideally to your lowest layer. So have it just a single uh, source of truth? Sorry? Have just a single source of truth? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yes. Yeah. So I think we can have some more questions offline and make some um, space for the next uh, speaker. Thanks again for attending. It was overwhelming to see so many faces. Thanks.